Welcome back to the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. In this format, which is realized in partnership with the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and Springer Nature, we have created an intimate space for interaction with global science leaders, innovators, and entrepreneurs. You, our audience, are encouraged to actively participate in this conversation. My name is Aline Lücken, and I am a senior editor at Nature Communications. It is now my extreme pleasure to welcome Jehan Karcholtepe today at the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. She is an astrophysicist in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the Rochester Institute of Technology. She is an expert in the areas of galaxy formation and evolution and PI of Cosmos Webb, the largest James Webb Space Telescope program. Before we start talking a little bit more about what you currently do, could you tell us about what got you interested in physics and astrophysics in particular? Sure. I think I always really loved science as a child. And I think the thing about astronomy in particular that really attracted me was just how strange it was and how like far out there it was and so far removed from the things we normally think about. So learning about the planets and learning about shuttle missions and, and that kind of thing always got me really interested. Um, and then, yeah, I've always been a pretty curious person. And so I've always enjoyed my science classes and everything. But astronomy in particular always was a passion for me. So you were the kind of kid that was following the NASA missions and kind of, you know, keeping connected with space exploration from a young age? Yeah, I was, yeah I'd watch Nova episodes on TV or re read the astronomy magazine articles or the, or, you know, articles that you see in the newspaper. So that was always something that I really enjoyed. Um, now moving to what you currently do, could you tell us a little bit more about the breakthrough that you presented here? Yeah, so today I talked all about the James Webb Space Telescope, what it was designed to do, some of the technical challenges it had to be overcome, and some of the first science findings that we are coming across. And I think specifically you talked about um, the coordination of mirrors and how this led to an improvement in image quality, but correct me if I'm wrong here, <laughs> I'm clearly not an expert here, but if you could provide yeah. a bit more detail. So the, the big improvement is really the size of the mirror. So JWST has a much larger mirror than previous telescopes like Hubble or Spitzer. Um, but what's different is that because it's so big, it wouldn't fit inside a launch vehicle as is. So it had to be designed in segments. And so those segments then can move on their own and the sides fold. So the whole thing could kind of be tucked in together and put in a, in a launch vehicle. And then flown out there and then it's sort of unpacked. Yes, and so then it launched and everything had to unfold. And so that was the scary part. <laughs> the launch is scary because you're putting something on a rocket, but we've been doing that long enough. We know we're pretty good at it. But you know, this thing having to now unfold and all, the, all these pieces come together and all these moving parts was, was pretty scary. <laughs> I can imagine that. So hmm. it really is amazing if you can't tell I'm, <laughs> you know, amazed by all of this sort of space exploration um, topic. It seems like um, it's a very interdisciplinary work, right? When you're planning for this kind of mission, you need all kinds of experts from different fields. So can you talk a bit more about the collaborative effort that is behind such a huge mission, really? Yes, absolutely. I mean, for something this big to happen, it requires many people all over the world it requires a lot of engineers it requires scientists it requires managers it requires you know rocket experts it requires you know people that work on detector building and cameras so there's a huge range of people that are required you know and, and in some ways the the scientists or the astronomers are the small piece <laughs> you know people like me we just want to use it afterward i'm not involved in in the design or the development um, but there are people who've spent their their whole careers really working on this project could you speak a little bit more about, so what I've now understood is that you build this, this huge mirror, you pack it up, you bring it into space. How do you train all of that on Earth? How do you make sure through experiments 
here on our planet that it will actually work up there. <laughs> a lot of testing was required and it's testing of all the individual components. So the cameras were built in labs and they were tested over and over. Um, once everything was kind of assembled together, it had to be tested. They had to test unfolding, refolding. You know, there's this whole sun shield on the telescope that's just these sort of layers of protective material to protect the telescope from heat. That whole process had to be tested. I think there's a YouTube video that shows a time lapse of them testing it in, in the lab to make sure everything works. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, more generally speaking, what would you say we can learn about our galaxy's history by looking at the sky? And sort of how far can we go back by looking at the stars and the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by, by looking at the sky, we can see galaxies at a wide range of distances from us. And so the galaxies that are the most far away, we're actually seeing light from them from a long time ago because it took light a really long time to get to us. And so with JWST, we can look all the way back to a period of about a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang. And that might sound like a long time, but in the grand scheme of things for the entire universe being something like 14 billion years, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of time. I'd like to invite our online audience again, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand function and we'll be happy to, to take those questions. I would also like to know how the observations that you've made with the JWST so far have maybe begun to challenge our understanding because obviously we're able to now reveal galaxies that, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope was unable to. Mm -hmm. So right now we're still in the early days of analyzing galaxies. Um, but one of the things that people have been finding is that there appear to be more galaxies that are relatively bright in the early universe, meaning that if we just count up the number of things we expected to detect, we're finding even more than we expected. Mm. And so that's currently challenging theoretical models. And so it might be that models have to be adjusted. It might be that some of those objects turn out to be something else. So more work on that will be needed. Interesting. Yeah, I can imagine that you're now generating so much data, <laughs> right? So analyzing that or storing that and then analyzing it must also be a great feat. Um. Yes, <laughs> um, it, it will become more so as we take more and more. I mean, the, the computational part is really in the processing, right? Once we have mm. these images, we have to calibrate everything, we have to combine everything, um, and that can be pretty intensive. And then once that step is done, then we just work with the final data products, and that's not quite as, as heavy. <laughs> right. The telescope has already managed to generate some awe-inspiring images that have really gone around the world and left countless people breathless, I'm sure. Would you say that these are the proudest moments for you when you get to share your research with the broader public? I would say moments like today, you know, <laughs> moments when I get to give talks about the work that we've been doing and the things we've been seeing are definitely some of my proudest moments. And maybe more of a critical question now, as with space exploration, space research is sometimes criticized by people who say, we have so many problems here on Earth, why do we need to do this research? What's the point? How do you respond to these voices? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's room in human endeavors to, to do everything, right? To spend some of our time and resources trying to solve the really critical problems. But I think it's also really important that we put energy toward towards achieving things, towards aspirational things. And something like astronomy, in a way it's disconnected from our day-to-day -day life, but it's awe-inspiring. I think there's probably children right now that are seeing these images from the telescope that might grow up to become scientists themselves. Right. And um, something that we have not discussed thus far is that in addition to being an accomplished researcher, you're also a woman, a minority in the physics field. Has this affected your career choices or progression in any way? So I don't think it's affected my choices specifically. I think I was very headstrong about what I wanted to do. And even if there weren't many other women, I was like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, 
but I think I've also been surrounded by supportive people and that's really helped. Like you, you definitely notice, you know, you go into a physics class and you look around the room and it's, it's mostly men. <laughs> that, that stands out, right? And that makes you feel a little less comfortable in that environment. It makes it a little bit harder to ask the questions or participate in the way you would like. And so, you know, eventually you have to try to overcome that, but it can be hard. But being surrounded by supportive people can, can really help a lot with that. What would you say to women who are maybe considering to go into physics who might be unsure? Because exactly, they might go into a classroom, look around, see no one else <laughs> who looks like them. What would you say to them to encourage them to pursue this path? Yeah. I would want those people to know that even if they don't see people that look like them, that they're still completely capable and can pursue that if that's what they want to do. And they may have to put a little bit of extra effort into looking for role models and not only focusing on, you know, the loud people <laughs> in the group, right? Trying to find people that can actually speak to them. Okay. How do you see the science landscape changing in the coming years to become as we said, is needed, more inclusive and supportive of minority researchers. Yeah. I think science has been changing over the years to become more inclusive. I think the astronomy community in general has become really good about this. The numbers, you know, the numbers at the most senior level are, are always awful, but the numbers that are, that are more junior have been improving. You know, one of the um, things that people have tried to incorporate, for example, for JWST, is are things like reviewing proposals anonymously, right? Not mm. taking into consideration the name of the person and where they're from and that sort of thing, but just viewing things based on the merit of the science and taking the name off completely. And when you do that, right, the numbers become a lot more balanced. Okay, that's good to know. If I understand correctly, we do have a question from the online audience, so we can take that now. Yeah, um, hello. Um, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, so I recently read that um, astronomers have discovered the closest black hole to Earth. Um, and I'm wondering how these news are perceived by the scientific community first. And second of all, what does it give us actually? I mean, it's um, quite fascinating knowledge, but do we get any practical use of it? Thank you. All right. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. The public is generally very interested in the topic of black holes and black holes near us. Um, the existence of a black hole nearby us doesn't really affect us, but I think knowing that they're there and being able to detect them uh, can help prove some of our theoretical models about how black holes form and how they grow. Um, yeah, we, you know, black holes are the end product of star formation, right? Massive stars will collapse into black holes. So really they should be everywhere in our galaxy. So seeing them nearby is just a confirmation of that. Thank you. Something else that I also wanted to ask you, you do some teaching, right? So what yes. do you enjoy about the teaching process? I love teaching, actually. It's, it's a really fun part of my job. Um, there's something about taking a concept that's really difficult and then trying to figure out how to explain that to someone else, right? You don't really, I think, understand something until you have to do that. You think you understand it, and then you're working on your notes, and you're trying to figure out how you're going to talk about it, and you're like, oh, wait, how does this actually work? And so it really forces you to go back and rethink things and question your assumptions so that you can turn around and explain it to other people. And you know that moment where you kind of see the light bulb go off when something clicks for someone can be really rewarding. I completely agree. It's not until you <laughs> explain something and have to teach it that you understand if you completely understand it yourself. <laughs> um, so we just talked about this... Um, theme of becoming more inclusive and supportive of minority researchers. You are a member of the Rochester Institute of Technology Women in Science Executive Committee. Could you tell us a little bit more about this group and do you think having analogous programs would be beneficial for other institutions? Yeah, so, so this group is a group of women faculty in the College of Science at RIT that uh, get together for a number of reasons. It was originally formed just as a place for women to get together and talk about their experiences and support one another. And so I think that's one 
really useful goal just to have that group, have that network. So when I first arrived, I didn't know anybody. And by connecting with that group, it was a great way for me to get to know people, learn about the landscape, you know, learn about who to go to if I have a problem or have a question. And I think that community is useful everywhere. Uh, the second function is things like organizing events and trying to improve the climate on campus for women. And that could be women faculty, but also women students. And so we organize events throughout the year to try to help uh, students position themselves in their career. And so that can be things like helping them apply to graduate programs or decide if graduate school is even something they want to do or helping them look for research opportunities and the kinds of things that you really need some kind of a network to be able to get that information. Otherwise, you might feel a bit lost as a student. Sounds really great. And once more, highlighting the importance of the support network, mm -hmm. in particular for women uh, in science. So I think we've gone through all of my questions. And I see that there are no more from the online audience. So. I'd like to ask you, where do you see um, your career or your research going in the next uh, five to 10 years, maybe as a concluding question? Yeah, I mean, I think I think these projects with JWST are sort of all encompassing at the moment. And so uh, I think much of the next five years of my life will will be involved in this. And it's all it's all still new. So it's really hard to see where it's going. Um, but I'd like to think we're going to continue on. We'll make new discoveries. You know, the, the launch for JWST was perfect so the lifetime is actually probably going to be longer than we initially thought um yeah and i, I look forward to you know helping to train the next generation of students that will be working with this data sounds so exciting <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your time and sharing your story with us thank you